again, Scott McKendrick. Uh, I am the head of Western Heritage Collections, one of the four curatorial departments at the British Library. But in this context, it's probably uh, as well to declare my other role, which is uh, the chair of what we call our Heritage Acquisitions Group, which is our major or senior acquisitions group that reviews and actually reviewed all of the things that, and approved all of the things that you're about to hear of this evening. So uh, it's going to be a little bit like seeing my life in, in uh, this evening. The library, as many of you know, has vast collections. Uh, it is one, at least one of, possibly, the largest research collection in the world, uh, around about 170 million items. And you might ask, so why does the library uh, want to continue to add to that? Uh, well, we see it as a growing, living collection. And one aspect of that, which is uh, quite scary, is that around about half a million contemporary publications come at us every year, uh, including digital, and the majority come through legal deposit, uh, so UK legal deposit, in which you are entitled to a copy of each uh, publication uh, produced in, in the UK. And then there's a smaller set, subset of that, which is uh, around about 500 items are acquired. And when I say items, that could be anything from half a leaf to uh, a whole room full of papers. Uh, these are very carefully selected. They don't just come at us. So they involve careful and expert curation to achieve that. It's one of the, the main things that curators do here is to continue to uh, develop the collection. And those are donated and they're also purchased. And they could be anything from something from the ninth century right through to this century. Uh, if they're unpublished and if they're printed they're from the 15th century <laughs> onwards. But they could also be in other formats, for example, historical sound recordings. And within that, there's an even more select uh, subset, which we call major heritage acquisitions. And it's about those items that you're about to hear. These are defined by their monetary value, not their intrinsic worth, but how much people are prepared to pay or how much they value them for. And we acquire around 20 of those each year. It's a very select group. Uh, and again, it could be anything from something very small, uh, like the St. Cuthbert Gospel, which we acquired uh, for just under, it was one pound under nine million pounds. Uh, or it could be part of a very large collection or entire library. It's part of the Blavatnik Honorsfield Library, the library acquired uh, both printed material and manuscript material, most notably uh, that relate or by the Brontes or relating to the Brontes. Uh, more recently, uh, or most recently, actually, this is the hot news, we have acquired two very contrasting items, uh, one of which is the first published history of cricket from the uh, late 18th century. And actually, it's the, now the only ex surviving example of that publication in a public collection. All the rest are in private hands. So we were delighted to acquire that. And at the other end of the spectrum, I mentioned historic sound recordings. We also acquired the earliest, uh, a recording of the earliest, uh, re earliest recorded concert of the Beatles. It's not quite complete because the reel ran out before <coughs> the concert ended. It was a concert at Stowe School, and that was a donation. That was a very generous donation. Uh, but you can see the contrasting uh, things that we do acquire. So uh, when we pay money for these, uh, a critical part of what we do is identify folk to support us. And one of the really great things is having 
behind us almost immediately the support of the British Library Collections Trust, who have been they're, they're the seed around which we are able then to grow uh, the, the funds necessary to make a major heritage acquisition. So our focus is on a few of these major heritage acquisitions that have been supported by the British Library Collections Trust. And let's publicly acknowledge uh, our thanks and uh, you know, great gratitude for that support. So without more ado, I'm going to hand over to Ferdinand Mount, who is going to act as host this evening. Over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. And welcome to um, this evening to celebrate the founding and the continued prospering of the British Library Collections Trust. This event is very much part of the celebrations of the 50th birthday of the British Library. That extraordinary enterprise, which some of you may remember, was so contested and controversial at its birth, both the site, the building, and the mere concept of it, and it, but it's now become to be regarded and I think revered of one of Britain's greatest uh, national institutions. Here at St Pancras, we are also celebrating the sixth birthday of the British Library's membership scheme, which now has more than 10,000 members. Not surprisingly, during the pandemic, we lost about a quarter of those members, but they've come um, trickling back, and it's a tribute to the attractions of membership, not least the delightful members' room and the concessions that you get for exhibitions and so on, uh, that we should have actually recoup the loss and more by now. The membership scheme grew out of the old Friends of the British Library, which I had the honour of chairing for a number of years, and which for several decades before that had done a huge amount to help acquire fresh treasures for the library in the way that Scott's described, that um, often it's not so much the amount of money that we were able to contribute as the signal that we gave that this particular item was well worth the support of these larger institutions like the National Heritage Lottery and so on. Um, anyway, when the membership scheme um, came in, the Friends quietly, and with some regret, retreated into oblivion. But to carry on the heritage function, the collection function, we established, not entirely seamlessly, there was, there was quite a few... Um, hiccups along the way, um, uh, but with the support of Rowley Keating and the staff of the library, the new collections trust to carry on the same work. And I think uh, we can say it hasn't done so badly so far. We contributed nearly £400,000 in grants to the BL in our first four years, and the treasurer tells me that at the turn of last year, we also had investments of £435,000 in the bank, so we're solvent. But of course we'd love to have more money, a lot more, and do even more exciting things with it. Donations and legacies from yourselves, your friends, relations, employers, and friendly charitable foundations, all will be eagerly and gratefully received. But tonight we're here not to talk about money, but about some of the wonderful things that we've helped to buy for the library. This is very much a collaboration between the Collections Trust and the library curators. And actually, it's also terrifically enjoyable because it's a real pleasure to listen to their uh, learned and entertaining pitches for their latest fancied book or manuscript or archive. And I'm delighted to have handed the chairmanship on to my old friend, the one and only Marina Warner, and I can only envy her the unique privilege of doling out other people's money to help buy these lovely things. Um, anyway, for this evening, I've been allowed back into the chair to introduce some of the speakers who will be talking to you about the items selected for this evening's entertainment. And we're going to begin with Professor Catherine Sutherland of Oxford, great expert on uh, romantic literature, who is going to tell you about a particularly famous letter from Jane Austen, a letter which contains a memorable phrase that 
so familiar to us, I'll leave it to Catherine to say what it is. And it's a particular kind of thrill to see the original come to rest here. So Catherine, if you'd like to um, take the floor. Hello. Hello. Good evening. The lost manuscript of Pride and Prejudice perhaps wrapped cheese or fish and fed the fire. Though no manuscripts have survived for Jane Austen's famous six novels, apart from two discarded chapters of the last novel, Persuasion, now here in the British Library collection, we have manuscripts for a few unfinished writings and for some of her letters. With writers' manuscripts, we're scrambling to save a dwindling cultural asset. Paper drafts begin to survive in significant numbers around 250 years ago, coincidentally around the time of Austin's birth. Now in the 21st century, as technologies of production and communication change, the traces of our electronic drafts are harder to reanimate or invest with the magic that attends the handwritten document whose words, unlike e-words, are unestranged from their moment of production. As we leave behind the craft of pen and pencil on paper, those manuscripts we have preserved will assume unanticipated kinds of extraordinariness. Her letters are our only evidence for Jane Austen, speaking, writing in her own voice. No diaries or journals survive. We know she must have written several thousand. Hers was a letter-writing age. And as a dependent female in a large and dispersed family, this was one of her sociable duties. But Cassandra Austin, her sister and chief correspondent, destroyed most of those she received, dividing those she kept as mementos among brothers, nieces, nephews. All that we know to exist have been published, 161 in total. <coughs> Since their publication, several of these originals have disappeared altogether, though it's not impossible that some of the lost holographs and even others so far unknown may one day come to light. Jane Austen's paper archive is tantalizingly slim, her cultural capital dizzyingly high. Any fragment, however slight, holds the potential to enlarge our understanding. In her case, unusual levels of author love, combined with a dearth of objects, provide a powerful index of both commercial value and public esteem. The two, commercial and public, are ultimately incompatible in their ends. The origins and development of library and museum collections are often fortuitous and piecemeal, in part because most public collections have grown from private beginnings, only later transferred through gift or purchase to public ownership. Such is the case with Austin's letters, divided by family descent and scattered internationally through sales. Institutions like the British Library that rely on scarce government grants and public funding cannot always compete to save manuscripts in an aggressive international market. Does this matter? I believe it matters very much. Some objects, authors' manuscripts among them, are constituent of a community and a common culture. We all have a vested interest in them. Folded and secret spaces, letters in particular, hold more meanings than are confined to their inscriptions. In a handwritten letter, there's an almost scriptural association of word with space that is disentangled only at the risk of loss. There are things to discover and to treasure in manuscripts beyond their words. Manuscripts are never used up. Save for the curious visitor to museum or library, handwritten pages realize something fresh the residue, or maybe the essence that print can't capture. The effort of imagination made physical in the shape of inked letters, personality or mood glimpsed or fancied in the casual or furious style of crossings out 
in color of ink in the format and quality of the paper itself. Where print makes meaning public, manuscript makes it intimate, a private compact between writer and materials that can live again in the receptive imagination. Manuscripts provoke reflective responses in scholar and exhibition visitor alike. So yes, manuscripts matter. Jane Austen's letters are the key to everything. Though early experiments in the novel, among them Austen's own, were written as a series of fictional letters, her novels are the first to see in the ordinary domestic letter a future for the novel as a study of life's everyday events. Dining out, drinking tea, walking to the shops, making friends, finding someone to love. In her letters, she invented a new voice for fiction, a freewheeling style that appears artless and intimate. But when their details are unpacked, her letters yield far more than at first appears. Her letter voice is very like that of her gossipy spinster, Miss Bates, in her fourth novel, Emma. Miss Bates, too, says and sees more than we might realize on a first reading. Reinventing the novel, Austen's genius lay in exposing the proximity of fiction to reality. This particular letter, known as number 146, is among the most precious of the few that survive for the rare glimpse it gives into Austen's views on her art of writing. One of her last, it was written to her young nephew, James Edward Austen, on the 16th of December, 1816, her 41st birthday and only months before she died. A teasingly affectionate letter she congratulates 18-year-old Edward, as he was known in the family, on leaving school. And that's, I don't know if you can actually see it, but it's some of the opening lines. And she writes, I give you joy of having left Winchester. Now you may own how miserable you were there. How often you went up by the mail to London and threw away 50 guineas at a tavern. Before commenting on the news that has reached her, that he has lost a portion of the novel he's been writing. Two chapters and a half to be missing is monstrous. It's well that I have not been at Steventon lately and therefore cannot be suspected of purloining them. Two strong twigs and a half towards a nest of my own would have been something. I don't think, however, that any theft of that sort would be really very useful to me. What should I do with your strong, manly, spirited sketches full of variety and glow? How could I possibly join them on to the little bit two inches wide of ivory on which I work with so fine a brush as produces little effort after much labor? Despite the generosity of her phrasing, setting a nest of my own against Edward's manly, spirited sketches full of variety and glow, the reader can't be in any doubt of the polite but firm assurance with which she here defends the scraps and morsels of her domestic scope against an alternative, but for her unavailable way of working. Not many months before, Edward had been practicing composition inside his aunt's teenage notebook, volume, volume the third, which incidentally is another BL treasure. He was using its pages to hone his skills. In this letter, in letter 146, the twigs Austin gathers here and there to make her nest for fiction are substituted only a few lines later by another image, the little bit two inches wide of ivory in which I work with so fine a brush as produces little effect after much labor. This has become one of the most quoted descriptions of Austin's art. But the former image of the nest is worth pausing over. <coughs> the only other place Austin collects objects together into a nest is when, in Mansfield Park, chapter 16, she describes Fanny Price's nest of comforts. The unwanted items, books, pictures, small mementos, discarded by other members of the family and salvaged by the lonely heroine. 
taking over the image of the nest to describe the constituents of the, mo of the mature Austen novel. Her modernist admirer, Virginia Woolf, wrote of something as ordinary as taking tea as among the regular twigs and straws out of which Austen's nest was to be made. Woolf's essay, published in The Common Reader, 1925, where she makes this remark, is a landmark of Austen criticism. Almost a century on, it's still vital and fresh. Austen's radical new style of writing appealed to modernists like Woolf and Samuel Beckett. Its essence, the novel reimagined as banality or everydayness, the close examination of particulars, the condition that appears to sit at odds with fiction making and that resists its shaping. What more natural, Woolf wonders, with this insight into their profundity than that Jane Austen should have chosen to write of the trivialities of day-to-day -day existence. Beckett called it the divine Jane's crochet style, declaring that her interlocking of art with life had much to teach him. If, as it so easily might, this letter had been one of the many hundreds that did not survive across the centuries. We would have lost not only a rare statement from Austen on the nature of her fiction, but a link in the chain connecting her minimalist art to that of her modernist admirers, a tangible link in the chain that is English literature. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that guided tour of those precious two inches of ivory, which will never be banned. Um, <laughs> our next speaker will be the writer and historian Emily Brand, who is going to talk about Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies, publication so bizarre that you can scarcely believe it ever existed. This application for a grant is particularly vivid memory for me because, as I remember, it came forward in the same meeting as the application for the Jane Austen letter, a piquant conjunction of two different worlds that illustrates how the library's collections cover the whole of human life. Emily, would you like to come on? Thank you. Hello, thank you. Yeah, it feels almost disrespectful. Uh, to Jane Austen to follow up with a book that confidently calls breasts lacteal hillocks of love. Um, <laughs> but here we are. Welcome to Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies. And this copy that was recently acquired by the library is dated 1793. Now, Harris's list is a curious blend of things. Um, it purports to basically be a directory of women working in the sex trade in 18th century London complete with addresses, fees, sexual histories of the women, and some very charming reviews. Or, as this edition itself elegantly puts it, a favourite treat to the sons of gallantry who purchase it as a pocket companion to assist them in the hour of delicate amusements. Now, quite how far this guide is based on the actual availability of sex workers is a little bit murky, um, though some of the women who feature certainly were real. It's also obviously designed to titillate its male readers, um, amounting in some decent stretches to really little more than just softcore pornography. But whatever the case, to the modern eye, it also offers a somewhat grimmer insight into the practice of, certainly the perceptions of, the sex trade um, in the era. And in its descriptions of the women itself, uh, themselves, it's also hard to escape it's almost proud showcasing um, of the, the underlying misogynistic values of the era. Now, the list wasn't a one-off. This copy um, came towards the end of a very successful run of publications from 1757 to 1795. And updated editions would appear around Christmas um, in early each year. 
And then there would be you know, special supplements as demand or new um, women on the market required. Now, this one, as we saw before, has been bound by a collector, but the lists were originally sold as neat pocket volumes, at, uh, first in taverns and then at a handful of shops around London. Um, they were cheaply sewn up together, and some of the surviving copies suggest that they were wrapped up in blue paper. So they were fairly discreet. They weren't grand as objects at all. Um, they'd be priced at around two and a half shillings, so they were aimed really uh, at middle-class readers. They'd run to around 150 pages. They might feature somewhere between 100, 120 women whose names tended to be very thinly disguised um, in kind of a sarcastic nod to, you know, protecting their reputations. Occasionally, a high-profile courtesan or actress would appear, but the majority are names that made little to no impression on the historical record elsewhere at all. Um, on one of the pages, I don't think it's that one, um, in this edition there is a Miss Stella Young of Googe Street, who incidentally did remind me a little of a Lydia Bennett who maybe hadn't been rescued by a Mr Darcy. She's described as a lovely teenager of an affluent family, stole away by a young gentleman from her mother's house in the night, um, but then abandoned in London, pregnant when it became here that no one was going to pay, um, pay for their way. So the grim reality of her situation, you know, that betrayal and her desperate poverty really in London is inevitably skirted over by our male author um, in favour of focus on her pretty legs and feet. The Harris of the title is thought to be Jack Harris, a waiter and a pimp working from a tavern in the district of pleasure that was Covent Garden, and his name would have been known to the, you know, his readership, um, so that would have been a marketing draw. And over the years, the book was attached to various authors and publishers working behind pseudonyms. And it really did sell. Um, one contemporary estimate stated sales of around 8,000 copies per new edition. And that success brings us to this copy of 1793, which is a rare and perhaps even unique survival, previously only known through references in a 19th century catalogue. So it's very exciting. Um, perhaps even better, it's actually a pesky rival copy to the official version, using Harris's name but undercutting on the price. Um, so the fact that there were competing directories on the market at once really shows the interest in these little books. And as well as providing a fully new set of characters, um, as the official list did tend to recycle them from year to year, but this one doesn't, one nice difference is that it also includes first names for most of the women. So for the historian, this is brilliant. Um, it could perhaps bring us a little bit closer to examining how much of this particular list uh, is based on real women. So what can this list reveal about Georgian London? Well, most obviously, it's a really revealing document in the history of sex and the sex trade. Um, though we can't take everything it says at face value, we learn of the services on offer, of fees, the types of women in the industry, and potentially how they got there. And it also tells us about male desire, what was expected, what titillated the 18th century reader, what was deemed attractive in a woman, and what wasn't. But widening this up, the lists give a lively, if to our eyes uncomfortable, snapshot of London. The perceived immorality of the sex industry did divide people of the time, but it was undeniably a very uh, visible and formative um, part of the city's fabric. So it shapes the character, it shaped the economies, uh, especially in certain districts of London. And by mapping the addresses, um, you can see they're given there, sometimes with numbers, sometimes just the streets. Uh, we can um, gain a new perspective on the geography and the social makeup of the city. And one brilliant project at romanticlondon.com has just done has done just that. They can cast light on gender and attitudes towards women, as well as um, publishing, erotic literature, reading in the era lower class material culture and domestic spaces. I think the, li the list is endless, really, for angles to take. But for me, the most tantalizing promise of this book lies with the women themselves. And this form of reading really requires entirely stripping away, as far as we can, that author's voice 
um, ignoring all the flowery erotica, but we can read between the lines. So, for example, we read disparaging comments about women wearing rouge and paint, or one woman who used too much soot and oil to darken her hair and was left stinking. So here we have, actually, an insight into the cosmetics that struggling women might use to appear more attractive. By cross-referencing additions, we can also, in trace, also trace entire careers, such as that of Miss Wilmot, who first appears in a liaison with the Duke of York, but then she features in successive editions until three years later, she's um, getting a much cheaper rate and there are comments on her degraded teeth, which suggests that she's contracted a venereal disease, possibly syphilis, um, and has been using mercury treatments for that. So we can find valuable insights by getting beneath that dehumanizing language um, and the potential fantasies of the male authors that really run throughout. Um, through what to them would have been incidental details. And it's important that we try to do this. Uh, it's a real opportunity to restore the experiences of those who didn't have a voice at the time and you know, they remain obscured. And the unearthing of previously lost copies like this, um, this one, really facilitates that study. In 1795, the lists were effectively closed down by a push against obscene books that dispersed poison to the minds of the young and unwary. And with that, new editions were stubbed out. And from the thousands initially in circulation, I think there are about 34 um, surviving copies known out there, dating from the 1760s to the 1790s, of which I think the British Library has five or six. Is this the sixth one? <laughs> Around that. Um, so it's a real privilege to have all of that preserved here. And as the lists finish by bidding adieu to our courteous reader and wish him every success that youth, health, love and wine can possibly inspire, I do the same to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Emily, for that uh, tour of the, the 18th century underworld. Uh, before we met, Catherine said that in fact, pointed out that, in fact, the worlds of Jane Austen and of Harris's ladies were not quite as remote as all that because the Austen Lee Bank um, was in Covent Garden um, in Henrietta Street. Um, so if Jane Austen had lived longer, who knows, she might have written uh, uh, um, uh, a Ladies of Covent Garden novel. It's a nice, nice thought. Um, for the next item, I'm afraid that a rank amateur has been drafted in to do the describing, uh, namely me. Um, and this is the monumental archive of John Galsworthy on loan at Birmingham University for many years till it was bought in its entirety by a private bidder, remained in the same collection till December 2021 when it was offered for sale to the BL and the Collections Trust made one of our larger grants, £15,000, to help secure it. The library um, already has quite a lot of Galsworthy material, including the manuscripts of the entire Foresight saga, which the author presented himself during his lifetime, and also quite a lot of the play scripts, which are held here as part of the Lord Chamberlain's play collections, an invaluable legacy of that much maligned functionary. Um, so whether or not the play, he passed the play or he didn't, uh, the script would finish up in the collections and eventually came to the BL, which has been a tremendous source for uh, theatre historians. And then, of course, there are also quite a few letters to great contemporaries such as Shaw and Chesterton. But the new acquisition is a real bumper bundle includes 45 autographed manuscripts of Galsworthy's novels and plays, mostly working drafts with substantial changes. The manuscripts, too, of poems, short stories, essays, reviews, speeches, and nine volumes of his diaries running from 1910 to 1918. Perhaps the highlight is the unbelievably collection of letters from all sorts of people, ranging from public figures such as Churchill, Baldwin, and Eleanor Roosevelt, to writers like Hardy, 
uh, Kipling, Catherine Mansfield, interestingly, and Edith Wharton. But above all, the 245 letters from Joseph Conrad, who I, had, I never knew this, had been a close friend of Galsworthy ever since they had a remarkable and very Conradian meeting aboard the sailing ship Torrens in Adelaide Harbour in the spring of 1893, when Conrad was first mate on the ship and had not yet written a line. Elmire's Folly was the first to come along. And they sailed together, um, Conrad and Galsworthy, across the South Seas. And their dearest wish um, was to meet with Robert Louis Stevenson in Samoa. But for some reason it didn't come off, but it's a, it's a lovely thought of the three of them meeting uh, in the South Seas. These letters are not only a prime source for Conrad's life and career, they enlarge our picture of Galsworthy too. And it's about our picture of Galsworthy that I'd like to um, say a few words. There's no doubt, and I'm sure you're all very well aware of this, that his image has been sadly diminished since its heyday in 1932 when he was awarded uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, already D.H. Lawrence and Virginia Woolf were hard at work undermining his reputation as a serious writer and relegating him to the ranks of journeyman realist. They would not have been surprised to see Galsworthy's huge latter-day success with the TV adaptations of the Forsyth saga. For the, in the eyes of the Bloomsburys, he really was little better than a TV scriptwriter avant la lettre. But I, I've always cherished a, um, a, a, an interest in Galsworthy because he was a contemporary of my grandfather's at New College, Oxford, and then as like young lawyers, they shared the same chambers. And in the saga, there's a gentle young man called Michael Mont, who I, whom Fleur Forsyte, you remember, marries, though she doesn't love him, and I always thought that was named after his friend. But I mention all this only to stress how sharply their paths then diverged. My grandfather became an orthodox Tory backbencher for 20 years, while Galsworthy, forsaking completely his background, became a passionate man of the left, prison reformer, supporter of trade union activists, remember, strike the play, um, opponent of censorship, inequality, aerial bombardment in war, and the inhumane treatment of animals. He was too old to fight in the Great War, and he was horrified by the spectacle of civilized nations fighting each other, but he volunteered to work in France as a physiotherapist, or masseur, as it was called then, for wounded soldiers, and he gave half his income to war charities. But I wanted to, us to do more than admire Galsworthy as a decent man whose heart was usually in the right place. What I hope is that this superb acquisition might do something to rehabilitate Galsworthy as a literary artist, a serious follower of Turgenev and Maupassant, and even worthy to be mentioned in the same breath, although very different, as his friend Conrad. And to my mind, the Forsyte saga is as fine an imaginative evocation of the bourgeois world as Thomas Mann's Buddenbrooks. Well, whether or not you have any sympathy with that claim, there's no doubt that the um, BL's hugely um, enhanced Galsworthy holdings will give us every opportunity to round out our understanding of the man and the writer. I, I just finally said that I reread the opening few pages of the first volume of Forsyth Saga um, a day or so ago, just to make sure that I hadn't been sort of nostalgic about it. And I must say, it was... It was as powerful and entertaining as I remembered, if not more so. So um, I recommend, uh, if you've got nothing better to do, uh, <laughs> have a go. Now, um, our next item is even more of a bumper bundle. There's no better aid to the recreation of a literary era than the complete archive of a journal or magazine. Browsing such an archive is the best possible way to understand what made the editors, contributors, and the readers, too, tick, what subjects caught their interest, and how they reacted to the issues of the day. 
Few periodicals, I would suggest, have embodied the literary sensibilities of their time better than Granta, ever since Bill Buford turned it into a literary quarterly in 1979. It had been a sort of university magazine for nearly a century before that. Um, to tell you about the Granta archive and the glories it contains, I'm very pleased to welcome Granta's new editor, Thomas Meany. Thomas, there. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, well, I should say at the outset that it's a great pleasure to know that the Granta archive is in the hands of this very fine institution, only 30 minutes from the Granta office, and that its final resting place is in the bunker in the American Midwest. You can consult the London Review of Books archive in the Ransom Center in Austin, Texas, or the V.S. Naipaul archive in a basement in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I wonder what he got for it, incidentally. But there's nothing quite like being a few steps from the Victoria Line. As I perused the uh, Granta archive a bit this week, I was reminded by something the American literary critic Christian Lawrenson pointed out not long ago, that the dominant literary style of the past decades may not have been sci-fi or satire or realism, magical, dirty, or otherwise, but rather careerism. Now that's something that I think is confirmed when you look into the archive. Much of the magazine's files are made up of intimate exchanges between readers and writers and editors. The exchanges between writers and editors in particular often feel like you're eavesdropping into the engine room of, a, of real literary culture and not the polite chatter of cocktail parties or book launches. It can sometimes read um, like things that were never meant to be overheard, like the bedroom talk of one's parents. There are exuberances, precise instructions, judicious praise, and of course, rejections. Now, for those among you who have been, uh, who've had pieces or articles rejected on submission, consider that we editors too deal with rejections all the time. Here are some letters that my poor predecessors received, um, which you can find in the archive. From Obernan Waugh to the editor of Granta. Thank you for your letter of 9th of July. I am sorry to say that I am not an academic, only a journalist. As I have no academic income, I cannot afford to spend time on the sort of enterprise you suggest. From Kingsley Amos to the editor of Granta, thank you for your letter. I am afraid that you are almost certain unable to, you are almost certain to be unable to afford me. Anyway, I will proceed on that assumption. The comment of Ruben Rabinovitz, which you quote, seems to me dismally unpromising. It is exactly the sort of thing that semi-literate semi -literate, semi -literate Americans always say to explain their feelings of puzzled inferiority when it comes to the English novel. <laughs> From Bridget Brophy to the editor of Granta, I am sorry to have taken so long to answer your letter of the 9th of July. I was inhibited by A, the, illegib the illegibility of your signature, which left me ignorant of whom to reply to, and B, you're not saying how much you pay, which left me without basis to decide whether to say yes or no. From Faye Weldon to the editor of Granta. What is strong writing? What isn't strong writing? Should writing be strong? I wish people would tell me these things. I don't think that you should refer to, quote, the vantage place from which only a woman's mind can provide, any more than you should say the vantage place from which only a man's mind, mind can provide. Or can you? Next time you're in London, you'd better come round. <laughs> now, I want to say a little bit about the history of Granta. Uh, the original version of the magazine, as, as Ferdinand Mount just pointed out, was um, founded in, in 1889 by students at Cambridge and was named for the river that flows through the town, or I think actually two tributaries of the, of the River Cam. But the modern version of the magazine uh, was started in 1979, a fairly seismic year, uh, the, the Islamic Revolution in Iran um, and other things. Um, and the founders of the magazine, or re-founders of the magazine, were two students at Cambridge, the American Bill Buford and the Englishman uh, Pete Debola. Now, their vision of Granta was born out of disappointment or frustration at what they took to be the desiccated state of British literary culture. And this is how they um, introduced their first issue. These were the opening lines. Quote, it is increasingly a discomforting commonplace that today's British novel is neither remarkable nor remarkably interesting. Current fiction does not startle, does not surprise, is not the source of controversy or contention. What is written today, what has been written since the time of the Second World War, can hardly rival what was written in the time immediately before it. What they proposed as a solution for the unremarkable British novel 
is essentially that it become more American. For in the late 1970s, the figures of Bellow, Updike, and Cheever were still in ascendance, not to mention avant-garde spirits like Walter Abish or Donald Bartlemy. Now, the other thing that they called for was more discussion about the state of writing. What they wanted was more writing about writing itself. Um, what they wanted was a debate out in the open without kid gloves about what fiction and nonfiction should be like. Now, of these two aspirations, one of them definitely came to fruition. Starting in the 1970s, British novelists, mainstream ones at least, did start sounding like American novelists. Martin Amos and Ian McEwan and others really did take American novelists as their tutors, much as Daniel Day-Lewis worshipped the performances of Robert De Niro. The other aspiration, perhaps we should be relieved about this, did not come to pass. Granted, did not become a place where the mechanics and stakes of writing were much chewed over. In fact, the magazine has been allergic to that talk, to that sort of talk for most of its history. Only recently have discussions about writerly craft, and I'd be curious to know when, when this word or term craft took hold, um, have begun to take place on the Granta website, but it's never been a very major concern of the magazine. Now, one of the strange things that did start to happen, both during and after Buford's tenure as editor of Granta, was that it went from being a home primarily of fiction to perhaps even a more prominent place for nonfiction, travel writing, reportage, and memoir. Consider that some of the most widely known pieces of the era were by Ian Jack on the inquest into the SAS killings of three IRA members in Gibraltar, or James Fenton traveling through the Philippines, or Jean Le Carré on the Swiss uh, general Jean-Louis Jean-Marie. Um, much of this is imperishable stuff, but not all of it has survived well. In some sense, you could say that Granta presided over the boom and the bust of travel writing as a genre. For in our own day, it seems a bit absurd to send a writer from, say, Chicago to write about Bangalore or from Manchester to write about Mexico City when there are writers, ones who in some cases are themselves readers of Granta, who are already in these places or live in them and are capable of writing about them far more effectively and in a way that meets the interests of both the Anglo readership but, but without striking locals as phony um, or obvious or exhibitionistic. Ian Jack, the editor who took over after Buford, has to be credited for building Granta's international reach, especially in India, where, where Jack reported regularly, and which became, the new, in the new century, arguably the magazine's most important readership. Like the, tang, like the Times uh, literary supplement in its own way, um, then Granta became very much a magazine of the Commonwealth, in a way that the LRB and the Paris Review have remained um, much more tethered to their respective imperial cores. Now, the main editor after Ian Jack was an American named John Freeman. He wanted to double down on this expanded geography of the magazine, and so he started a global network of editions uh, that spanned from Bulgaria to Nigeria. Um, there, are many, there are still very many um, successful freestanding versions of Granta in Spain, in Portugal, and in Israel. In some sense, Freeman saw the mission of the magazine is to capture different perspectives on what seemed like the emerging form of the global novel, or the global short story, made up of participants in the sweep of the phenomenon that came to be known as globalization. Today, the magazine is in a different place with different challenges. In some sense, the state of nonfiction writing in the Anglosphere has rarely been healthier. There are entirely new outfits like the Guardian Long Read that publish long form reportage, sometimes on the Granta model, much more frequently than Granta itself does. In an age of supposedly short attention spans, there is somehow a correspondingly large appetite to submerge oneself completely in a piece of nonfiction. The only thing that Granta can do in this much more varied landscape is to make sure that its writing about subjects, no matter how journalistic, still aspires to the condition of literature. We believe that there is a surfeit of moral, moral critique in contemporary nonfiction and a shortage of accurate reconnaissance about the real political conditions in particular cities, regions, and countries. And what about fiction? Here, the challenge is different from the days of Buford and Freeman. No one is any, no one is any more long, no one is, any, uh, is looking anymore for the perfect synthesis of American and English writing, nor does the global novel that one might have expected to be in the Ofing in the 1990s, uh, does that seem like much of a starter today? Instead, Grant is focused on regions, on deep contexts, on writers who commit, whose commitment to local idioms makes them the greatest, challenges for, the greatest challenge for, for translators. We believe, of, above all, in the reigning principle that novels and stories must give pleasure. Pleasure is in command. To, to paraphrase the late Milan Kundera, who died this week, we believe that far from having exhausted its possibilities, contemporary fiction has merely failed to explore the real possibilities within it. Thank you. Thank you so much for charting the 
interesting and subtle changes that Grant has undergone through um, those 40 years, and also particularly for me, um, mentioning Ian Jack, who we sadly missed, died recently, who was one of the great uh, journalists of our day in the sense that every um, newspaper or magazine he passed through was left uh, quite remarkably um, affected by his um, imaginative um, and, and innovative approach. The Sunday Times um, insight and uh, reportage, Granto, as Thomas has just described, and then his later work uh, for The Guardian, in which he pioneered the charming genre of industrial nostalgia um, um, articles about uh, old steamships and um, all the bringing back, reminding us of the extraordinary changes that have gone, that um, former industrial eras have gone through. And it was a remarkable kind of literary archaeology, really. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, next up, our last literary contribution, as you might say, is um, an acquisition that we jumped at as soon as the possibility was raised. This is the archive of the novelist Andrea Levy, the author of Small Island. She died of cancer far too young in 2019. But her archive is full of drafts and ideas for the future that she was working on. Um, it was a fascinating article about all the technology that may resurrect some of her schemes. This is the first archive uh, of a black woman writer to come to the library and to describe some of the things that the archive contains and to talk about her uh, both as a writer and as a longtime friend. We're very lucky to have the distinguished author and journalist Gary Young. Gary. Thank you. <clears throat> in her biography of Harlem Renaissance writer Zora Neale Hurston, Valerie Broyd explains why it was so difficult to track Hurston's whereabouts during the novelist's early 20s. In 1911, she writes, it was relatively easy for someone, particularly a black woman, to evade history's recording gaze. If not legally linked to a man as daughter or wife, Black women did not count in some ways, at least to the people who did the official counting. That question of who counts and whom is counted is not simply a matter of numbers, it's also about power. The less of it you have, the less say you have in what makes it to the ledger and what form it takes when it gets there. Collecting information, particularly about people, demands both the authority to gather data and the capacity to keep and transmit it. Those who have both the authority and the capacity need to feel that the people on whom they are keeping tabs on matter. And that's why Andrea's archive being here in the British Library matters. For while she died a celebrated award-winning author, that was not, for much of her professional life, how she lived. For most of her literary career, Andrea was a working class black woman from Arsenal who had the audacity to write books that were acclaimed but not necessarily widely read. In a range of ways, as far as the world of British letters were concerned, she did not count. And this was not an affliction exclusive to her. It's worth noting that Maya Angelou initially struggled to find a United Kingdom publisher for I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Such was the race-based fatalism around British publishing that you could write the excuses for the exclusion of black British women from their lists before the professionals ever even uttered them. Agents wouldn't know how to sell them. Publishers wouldn't know how to edit or market them. Readers wouldn't know how to read them. Reviewers wouldn't know how to write about them. They didn't count. As someone who described her younger self as this girl who had shop girl written right the way through her, Andrew was both aware of this and refused to accept it. Her presence in this archive and on so many bookshelves globally came from a deep 
urgent need to both articulate her reality and be heard, which was aided by political developments elsewhere. On a handwritten note from the 5th of July 1989, she rhetorically poses a range of questions about her identity and repeats the refrain. This is a note to herself that was found after she died by her widower, uh, uh, Bill Mayblin. The feelings of unbelonging are strong. And then she goes on to spell out what she wants to achieve in her writing. It's a deeply personal statement of validation, self-validation, exploration and explanation. She wrote, I feel the need to articulate my life and feelings. I feel this need very, very strongly. I want people to understand the world through my eyes. I want it to help others and just shed a little light on life from my point of view. I want to be listened to, respected. No, I need to be listened to and respected. I need to be creative. I need to make something of myself in, quote, their eyes as well as my own, end quote. And here we are. When I first met Andrea at Garden Summer Party in 1999, she still felt very much as though she were on the outside looking in. She was standing on her own when I approached her and told her I was a great admirer of her first two books. She smiled and withdrew slightly, mistaking me either for a stalker, predator, or a fantasist. It took all of my powers of persuasion to get her to agree to have lunch with me. I was deeply, deeply suspicious, she recalled. I'd never had anybody do that to me before. We became close friends. She was like an older sister to me, protective, encouraging, generous, gently chiding, affectionately mocking, always loving. When I visited from America, she would make sure the fridge was stocked with all the things I loved, invariably fattening or alcohol-related, which she would then tease me about. When we suggested that Bill, her husband become the godfather to my daughter who's called Zora. Andrea complained but what about me? And I said to her but you just told me that children think that you are going to make them into a handbag. <laughs> I assumed that you wouldn't be interested but that's different it's your child and I said well you know how was I to know that? <laughs> so I said okay well then you know you can also be Godmother, no, I don't want to do it now. <laughs> you're only doing it because I said you had to do it. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm doing it because I didn't know that you were. No, you're not. So this was my relationship with Andrea. Seeing her options open up with the success of Small Island was a real joy. She wrote to me describing the excitement of being invited back to Centerprise, a bookshop and a community center in Hackney, now closed down, where she'd done readings for her previous books and her shock at the reception for Small Island. Usually I get 10 in the audience, she wrote, if I'm lucky. This time the place was filled to capacity, 100 or more. There was almost a sense of ownership coming from them about the book, which was really nice. I felt well loved up, I can tell you. After I wrote a column defending the right of black and brown Parisian youth to take to the streets against racist policing, she emailed her support. I fear that you may need to watch your back more than usual. You know where I am if you need me. She once told me that the success of Small Island had liberated her from striving. But the sense of precarity, of unbelonging, that paradox of being both acclaimed and yet not exactly claimed, was harder to escape. Bill found a dialogue she'd written after her death, that he found a dialogue after her death, she didn't write it after her death, where two voices are in her head and they're debating whether she should write a memoir. One is scathing about the idea. Who do you think you are? You don't write memoirs, that's for people who went to Oxford. The other was more encouraging. But it's quite an interesting time that you've lived through and you've got something to say. When Andrea agreed to speak to the British Library's oral historian, Sarah O'Reilly, about her life on tape, O'Reilly was, cu was curious as to why she'd agreed to do it. Andrea answered, it was like I imagined you into being. You wrote to me and said, would you let your life flash before you? You're dying, 
And would you come and tell me about the life that you lived? And not only personally, or for a newspaper, but for a country which I feel absolutely a part of, but not everybody feels that I am a part of. So I said yes, because who gets to do that? And here we are. Standing before you now with her books on syllabuses and a growing body of work around the world, which is becoming known as Levy Studies, it seems obvious that her body of work and all the workings out that go with it should be here in the archive. But it's important to understand that it was never obvious to her. And that in a moment where we have Windrush commemoration but no Windrush compensation, her sense of marginality, even in her success, is one many of us share. That when it comes to who counts and who is counted, her presence in this archive marks a welcome shift when it comes to the power of race, sex and class. Because the sense of ownership she felt that night in Centerprise extends not only to that book, but her body of work of which this library is the guardian. In her 1979 essay, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, A Cautionary Tale and a Partisan View, Alice Walker wrote, we are a people. And a people do not throw their geniuses away. And if they are thrown away, it's our duty as artists and as witnesses for the future to collect them again for the sake of our children, and if necessary, bone by bone. And here we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. That was very moving. And uh, I think if anyone had any doubts about the value of the work that the Collections Trust and the British Library does, um, that would dispel those doubts. Um, I'm now um, scooting off from the chair and giving way to uh, my old friend Marina. Where's where she got to? Over there. Um, <laughs> who will introduce the final item. Thank you very much. When I was asked to take over from Ferdinand Mount, um, I did feel that it was a great honor, but I also felt that when he described to me what work would involve, that it was going to be a huge pleasure. And I think that you can see from the range of works that he presided over the library acquiring, what a, what a treasure, what a, what a marvellous treasury this is, and how lovely it is to be close to it in any way, especially chairing the committee. Uh, so I wanted to thank, above all, um, Ferdy for this marvellous evening and for all his, what he said and how he steered us through it, but I, and also the, all the trustees and the members of the committee who've helped put this together, and above all, the British Library staff who helped us very, very much. And now to the grand finale. Um, we're very fortunate in having San Sandra Tuppen here, who is the head of the music collections here at the library, who is going to introduce a performance of a chamber trio by Handel, a manuscript which the BS BLCT helped acquire, giving £20,000 towards its purchase five years ago, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been asked just to say a few words about our music collections before I introduce our musicians for the last item. Um, in the music collections department, we hold both printed music, which dates from the very early beginnings of music printing in around 1500, right through to the present. And we acquire music through legal deposit and also through purchase. We also have a large collection of music manuscripts and music archives. And our strengths in those areas, I think, are very much around 20th century music, um, particularly British music um, and music performed in Britain. So these days we are very keen to acquire more material relating to that area. Um, we have a lot of manuscripts of composers such as Elgar, Delius, Vaughan Williams, Benjamin Britten, but we're also acquiring archives and music manuscripts of composers who are alive today. One example um, 
in that category is music of Robin Holloway. We managed to acquire his music manuscripts with the generous support of the British Library Collections Trust a few years ago. But it's not just 20th century and, and, and later material that we have. We also have a very large collection of music manuscripts dating from around about 1500 onwards. And among the jewels in the collection are a very large number of music manuscripts by Handel. George Frederick Handel, although born in Germany, came to England um, around 1710 and spent most of his career working in England. And right at the heart of our music manuscripts collection are about 100 volumes of Handel's manuscripts in his own handwriting. And these were mostly acquired as part of the Royal Music Library that um, the late Queen presented to the British Library in the 1950s. And these include the um, first, earliest known draft of Messiah and music for his other oratorios and operas. So we were absolutely delighted in 2017 when an opportunity arose to acquire another Handel autograph manuscript. And this is one that Handel wrote before he came to England. He wrote it in 1708 while he was still in Italy. It's a vocal piece, a trio, called Sei Tu Non Lasci Amore. It's scored for three voices and continuo. Um, it's about love, um, as so much music was and still is. Just to summarize the text, um, which is in Italian. Um, if you don't forsake love, my heart, you will repent. Far from your beloved, you will have nothing but pain. But who am I talking to? Oh God, when I no longer have a heart, or the heart I have is no longer mine. So along with this manuscript was also a letter from George III, King George III. And this is a letter that he wrote when he had borrowed the manuscript and returned it to the person who owned it after Handel's death. And in it, he describes Handel as the unrivaled author. So he obviously held Handel's music in very high esteem. So I'm delighted to welcome onto the stage now musicians to perform this work for you. We have Claire Wilde and Joanna Sonji, sopranos, um, Phil Wilcox, tenor, and Masumi Yamamoto on harpsichord, and Ibrahim Aziz on viola de gamba. So please welcome the musicians. Thank you. 